Welcome to The Insider, the official podcast for the city of Murfreesboro. I'm Mike Browning. Thanks a lot for joining us. Our topic today is building in codes and inspections and other issues within that department. Kevin Jones is the director of the building and codes department, and we thank you for joining us, Kevin. You've been around for a while. You've uh, served as an inspector as well, so you've come up through the ranks. Yeah, started out as a property maintenance inspector right out of college. Um, and then moved up to plans examiner, uh, assistant director, and finally director uh, for just over a year now. And why do we need a building and codes department in the first place? So they play a vital role. Uh, the main, you know, the main purpose of a building codes department is to ensure the public health and safety welfare. Um, but it also plays more roles than that. I mean, not only are we ensuring that the occupants are safe in a structure, but we're also ensuring that in an event uh, that the firefighters and first responders can get in that building. So a lot of people don't realize, they just think about getting out of a building, but there, there are people who go in that building. Um, so we have to make sure buildings are designed properly and built to code. So in an emergency, uh, fire department can get in that building and get people out. So there's that, and there's also, it creates a, a, just a standard just a building standard. I mean, imagine going in, a, in, a, in a, any building and it's, they're not identical, right? Imagine if anything went. Um, you could have different, different door sizes, different hardware height. I mean, so at least it provides that uniformity of every building. Um, so that's, that's some of the key factors that, that we play. And, and I think having a good code system in place in a city helps everybody. Most people are probably not aware that the, the idea of codes and doing that kind of thing originates with, with disasters like fires and floods. Yeah, correct. A lot of the code is, is reactive. So events happen and that's how codes get put in place. So codes is, is nothing new. Um, it's been around, uh, the first code on record that I know of is around 1750 BC. It's in Babylon. Uh, that code was put in place and it held contractors and designers to certain standards. Um, it was a little more ruthless at that time. Um, it was kind of eye for an eye. So the way, it, the way that code read was if a contractor built a building and somebody was hurt in that building, you in turn could hurt the contractor. So we've progressed over the years, <laughs> but the modern day code um, really, like you said, came out of tragic events. So the fires in Chicago, late 1800s, that was one of the main starting points for the modern day code. So once they had the fire in Chicago, I think early 1900s, the insurance company got together and they formed a code uh, to kind of prevent that, also prevent uh, building loss because they are an insurance company. So that's what they're thinking about. They don't want to pay out. So that's when you start seeing firewalls and other protections go into buildings. But then it also progressed into how can we protect the occupants as well. Um, so that was early 1900s. After that, the code really was regional. You know, so the southeast may have a code, the northeast may have a code, the west may have a code. And then that really stayed regional until the late 1990s. And then the codes got together and formed the I code, which is the international code. And this is kind of what these books are here. This is just a sample of those books that we enforced, but the I codes came together and in 2000, they produced the international code. So that was the first, you know, recognized standard internationally that we have. And now everybody, like I said, enforces these codes. When, when you say international, are we talking worldwide or just yeah. in our area? Yeah, no, that's, it's pretty much most people in the country in the US definitely enforce the I codes is what we call them international codes. But it's also gonna be, you know, any, any developed country with a code, I would say they're going to enforce the international codes. Your inspectors go out and then observe like new construction, for example, or even remodeling. Um, what happens when one of those either new construction buildings or um, a remodeling seems to be outside of the code or they're in violation? Yeah. So, you know, our guys go out um, usually uh, inspections are called in, right? So the contractor will call for an inspection once a permit is issued. Uh, and then we'll go out and look at the job. So we'll walk around um, and, you know, 
like I said, we have about 10 different codes that we're, that we're enforcing, anywhere from just the basic building code to mechanical plumbing, fuel and gas, uh, you name it, we enforce it. So we'll go out and look at it and say, for instance, um, you know, you're back, you have a back porch and it doesn't have a guardrail on it. So mm -hmm. if, you have a, if you have a deck or a porch that's more than 30 inches off the ground, uh, you got to have a guardrail on it so nobody could fall off and get, get injured. So in that case, say for instance, there's no guardrail, our guys are gonna write that up. They carry correction notices with them. So we'll normally leave a list, give that to the contractor and say, hey, in order to proceed uh, with, your, with your project, you must f fix these issues. So once those issues are fixed, uh, they'll call it back for inspection again, and then we'll go out. And then once, once everything on that correction list is passed, um, you can proceed until the next, next phase. So there are code violations that you have to enforce and make sure that they're done really to protect mm -hmm. the people uh, make sure the standards are met but there's also building permits that you issue right. or at least the city issues here why do we need those so again building permits we issue that as a, as a way that we can go out and ensure that your construction is up to certain standards uh, again we're, we're looking out after you were another set of eyes right so if your contractor's doing a job you know, it kind of gives a homeowner, uh, you know, a little better feeling that somebody else is checking up on their work, right? So, you know, we're, we're only out on the job maybe for four or five different inspections. So we're not, we're not on jobs that long during the whole project, but we are a different set of eyes that go out and check it to make sure it is up to code and make sure it's safe. And your, your contractor is performing the job adequately. And then also, um, by pulling a permit, it's gonna add value to your property. Because what happens a lot is when people go to sell their house, and if you, didn't, if you didn't do the work correctly or you didn't permit it, that's normally when it comes back on you, right? Because your new buyer is gonna have a home inspection done, um, or what you try to list your house as far as like square footage. You know, say, say you have a 2,200 square foot house, and you're listing it for 2,500 square feet. Uh, so there's 300 square feet in there that nobody knows about but you finish that expandable in your attic but you never get permits for it uh, so that's kind of draw going to draw a red flag is that why it's important that you have a certification of, or a certificate of occupancy yeah that that it is so what happens when you when you complete that project uh, with a permit you'll get a CFO and it'll show what you did so say you finish that expandable area so all of our records actually go to the property assessor um, so that's how they're updating their records. And that's where you could get that mixed match of, well, the property assessor says you have a 2,200 square foot house, but you're selling 2,500 square feet. So there's 300 that's not, not done. So a lot of work that is done, um, I, guess, I guess illegally, without permits, um, you may get away with it then, but if you ever go sell that house, it's normally gonna catch back up to you. Um, or if somebody sees that. So it's, it's always best that we recommend just, just get your permit uh, to begin with, and we'll be more than happy to go out there and meet with you guys and, or the homeowner and see what's needed uh, to move forward. Speaking of permits, maybe there's some confusion on the part of homeowners or people as to what requires a permit and maybe what doesn't. Kind mm -hmm. of explain your experience with, with those issues. Yeah, that's... that's um, I normally like to say, if you knock a hole in the wall, you need a permit. Um, it's almost as simple as that. So if you, if you change out like for like, say you wanna put a new roof on your house, you know, we're not gonna make you get, a, get another permit. If you, if you tear off the shingles and put new shingles on, you don't need a permit for that. If you take a broken window out, put a new window in, you don't need a permit for that. So if you're changing out maintenance like for like, you're okay. But again, if, if you knock a hole in the wall, at that point, you're probably rearranging something, either electrical, plumbing. There's a reason you'd put a hole in the wall. So that's a good that's a good start. But you know, it doesn't hurt. Just give give us a call. You know, we, we'll talk to you. Uh, we got a staff up there that does a great job, and they'll and they'll let you know whether you need a permit or not. I, it's always better to ask first, than uh, get through a project, then find out you need a permit, and then it, it just makes it a lot harder to to go back and retrofit all that stuff. So you're talking about things like you're changing something that might affect a load bearing wall, mm -hmm. you're, you're knocking out a window to become a door and right. you may have to adjust the electrical lines because of that. So if it gets into those larger issues, 
yeah. you need to come here and and what's the process to to come to the city hall and and file for a permit yeah so you're able to go online to murfreesboro.tn.gov you go check out the department section go to building codes we have a permit drop down so you can apply online and check out all those applications we've recently just pretty much redone every application that we have just to make it user friendly. They haven't been updated in maybe 10 years or so. So going back, looking at those, some of the terms were outdated uh, or maybe they just didn't flow as good as we thought. So we've, we've really redone every application and at the top of every application, it kind of gives you a step of what you need to do. So if you're gonna put an in-ground pool, you may need a, a survey done uh, by a professional or a plot plan. But if you're just gonna do a fence permit, something simple, uh, you're, you know, if you want to go to our GIS website as well, so the GIS website is also found at MurfreesboroTN.gov, and that is a really great tool for citizens to use um, if you're just thinking about doing anything to your property. So our GIS, we probably have one of the best GIS teams that I know of. Uh, Gerald Lee and those guys do a great job, and they have a lot of information for free, uh, which, is, which is nice, and we use that tool every day. But... Any, the citizens can log on, check out GIS. It's free. You can, you know, look up your property. You, you can have, there's 20 years of aerial photos of your property on there. So you can kind of see how your property has progressed, especially if you're looking at buying a home. You know, you'll be able to check out how that home has changed over 20 years. But it also shows you all the easements. Because um, you may have a, a sewer easement in the back of your yard, and you may not even be able to build that pool. Or, or have that fence in that sewer easement. So that's always good to know your options before you get into a, get into a, you know, a project. You mentioned two things. I think you mentioned pools and fences. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, some people may be aware that you need a permit for that, but others may not. But you do need a permit for those two things most of the time. Yeah, for sure. So you'll need, anytime you put a fence, you need a fence permit. Uh, pools, you're going to need a pool permit. Um, and then another one, especially with the pools, is we want to make sure they're going to be safe. So usually if you put a, if you put a pool in, most of the time you're going to have to have a fence to surround that as a barrier. Um, so those are, those are just two types. Also, if you do an HVAC change out, you're going to need a permit for that because not necessarily HVAC change out, but you are going to deal with uh, electrical to hook that back up. Um, so we recommend electrical permit for that, and our, and our team will come out and inspect that to be sure it's installed properly. So are those some of the most popular uh, types of permits, the pools and fences? Yeah, so we, um, I guess I'm gonna kind of brag on our staff a little bit here. So we issued uh, over 10,000 permits last year. Um, so we have five permit techs that issue all those permits, which I mean, they do a tremendous job. So they're also, they're also issuing the permits. They are you know answering the phones, they're answering emails doing all that other work while preparing permits. So out of those 10,000 permits that were issued, uh, we performed over 40,000 inspections last year. So wow. we have 12 inspectors on that side. Uh, there's three electrical inspectors. We have three property maintenance inspectors. We have three residential inspectors. And then we also have a sign inspector, um, which concludes those 12, ins 12 inspectors. Um, and then the plan review, sometimes you, you review either, uh, a plan for a type of development. Mm -hmm. Um, and there are, there's a lot of growth here. So, right. yeah. So, um, I was kind of looking at some numbers and we've averaged as far as single family homes over the past four years, we've averaged 1700 new dwelling units a year for four years straight. So I kind of look at that as an, an easy way to look at that would be 1,700 new front doors a year, and that's just residential. So residential, we don't require plan review, but commercial, you're right, we do we do require a commercial plan review. So with that, at, with that, uh, most architects, developers will submit their building plan, and we'll review it in house. We have two plans examiners that review all of our plans. Usually, once you review it. Um, you submit the plan to us, we'll have a meeting once a week in our office and other departments will come to that meeting, including fire, water, sewer, and planning. So we're strictly looking, when we do a plan review building codes, we're officially just looking at just the building. 
Um, so you're going to have a site plan to go with that, but that's a separate review process that that our planning department does. Because there are things like buffers and other issues. Right. There could have parking lot requirements and your buffers and landscaping. So planning looks at just the site plan. Meanwhile, we're looking at only the, the construction of the building and we're reviewing that again for life safety issues, mechanical, plumbing, electrical. And then at the end, at the end, once our review is complete and once planning's review is complete, we put those two plans together. So we put the building plan and site plan together, and then we issue the permit. Are there some typical uh, things that you confront that uh, maybe the public should be aware of in terms of what are maybe the most popular or the most often things that maybe get changed or, or scrutinized the most? As far as like a residential or commercial? Commercial. So we're always going to look at life safety. Uh, that's the main thing. You. The code gives you, depending on the use, right, there's different uses in the code, whether it's a business or an assembly, educational. Um, so there's different requirements per the use. But a lot, of the, a lot of the main things are, again, we're looking at life safety, making sure there's enough exiting out of that door, uh, out of the building, enough exits out of the building compared to how many people are going to be in that building. Um, and then only smaller ones, a lot of it, um, actually bathroom requirements. Uh, so the code regulates the bathroom requirements. So we have a lot of spaces that may only have one bathroom. So we're making sure that, you know, they're either going to have to add another one. Uh, little things like that. So, like I said, it's more life safety to make sure you can get out. But there are things so, such as door location um, and, and bathroom requirements and mm -hmm. other, other things. Contractors generally are trying to follow the, the code themselves, right? I mean, you, you oh, typically yeah. find that, you know, they're professional. When you have these really large developments... Uh, I, I think of one, for example, that everyone sees that's on Medical Center that's going up. I'm mm -hmm. Clary Park. That's large, you know, yeah. and then there have been others like that. How, how do you go about doing that? Do you use more than one inspector or how do you accomplish that? <laughs> no, we actually, um, one inspector will normally inspect that whole job. So our inspectors are certified to do mechanical, plumbing, gas, and then building. So you'll have one inspector to do that, and we also have an ele electrical inspector on that job. So technically, we will have two inspectors: one that does electrical, and one one that does the rest of the rest of the the job. But um, so we're just out there quite a bit on those large jobs. You know, I'd say a couple times a week we're going to be out there because uh, usually on large jobs, we're just taking a, s a small bite at it at a time. So we're gonna go out and they may only need one floor inspected. We're not gonna do the whole building, but so we're just gonna do pieces of it at a time. Um, and then our fire department is great too. They're, they're out there as well. So the fire department's doing inspections. And then you also have you know the, the architects and, and they have some third party inspectors that we're leaning on too. So I mean, it really takes a team, uh, but for the majority of it, we just have one inspector per job. Your department also, um takes a close look at property maintenance violations mm -hmm. and that probably hits home to most of our listeners yeah. uh, because there are those involving like grass or parking on a lawn. Uh, explain some of those violations and wh what you're looking for. Yeah, so code enforcement to me that's one of the most important divisions or arm that we have in building codes. Uh, that's really what keeps the standards of the city, keeps your property values up. So we do over 2,000 code inspections a year. Um, well, actually 2,000 cases. So really, every time we start a case, we're probably gonna do two or three inspections. So that's normally about 6,000 inspections a year of property maintenance. But we're gonna go out, and, and most of those are gonna be citizen complaints. You know, it's probably 50-50. Mm -hmm. uh, our guys will also drive around town and pick up stuff on our own. So they're not all just citizen complaints. And a lot of that is, Right now, especially weeds and grass, it's that time of year. So you have to maintain your, your, your lawn below 12 inches. Another thing is open storage. So that could be numerous items just kind of, you know, scattered about the, the yard that really don't belong in the yard. So we'll write up open storage. You got, you got lawn parking. Um, so you gotta be parked on a hard surface. Inoperable vehicles or junk vehicles, uh, we'll write that up. Uh, so the whole, you also have number of animals, which we, we don't run into that too much, but you're only allowed four dogs. You can have, I believe, six cats, uh, cats yeah. eight chickens. They, can, they have to be uh, fenced. They can't run, run a large. Uh, no roosters. Uh, we do get quite a few roosters a year that we have to uh, 
you know, ask the homeowners to, to get rid of. It sounds like that's designed to protect the other neighbors, like either from mm-hmm. noise or just nuisance, right? Yeah, it, it, it is. And like I said, we, we'll respond. And if you, the citizens can, you know, email our team, you can call in our staff. Uh, they'll answer the phones, take your request. And like I said, we'll send one of our three inspectors out. So at that time, once we respond and there is a, we see a violation, We'll send we'll send the the owner a notice, giving them twenty days to correct that violation. And if that violation isn't corrected in twenty days, we'll go back out, recheck it, and there is a possibility to issue a ticket and take them to court. Another common thing on properties are sheds, and I don't think you require a permit for that unless something comes up like a, a violation where it's on either a property line or an easement or something. So we do require permits for sheds. Okay. If they're greater than 120 square feet, so if they're a 10 by 12, say you go say you go buy a 10 by 12 shed at Lowe's, um, and it's portable, you don't necessarily need a permit, but we do always ask. Just call us. Um, just because you don't need a permit doesn't mean you may not be able to place that there, because again, this kind of goes back to our GIS tool. You may have an easement on your property that you're not aware of, um, and then you place that shed in that easement. And then we have to come back and maintain that easement. So we're going to ask you to move that shed. So you may not need a permit uh, for a shed smaller than 120 square feet, but it's always a good idea. Just call us, you know, reach out to us or planning. Um, come up here and say, this is where I want to put it. And we'll be like, yeah, great, put it there. So when you say that you do require a permit for the larger, I think mm-hmm. over 10 by 12, it makes me think about garages as right. well. Like you're putting up a new garage on your property. And so that it that does require for permit. sure. What are you looking for when someone is constructing a new garage? So when you're going to construct a new garage, um, you're going to come up here, submit an application, and again, we're going to check setbacks. Uh, make sure you're not too close to the property line. Make sure you're not too close to the principal structure. And then after that, um, you know, it's, it's pretty simple at that point. But the main thing is we're just checking to make sure the location is correct. And once your location is correct. Uh, everything's good. We're going to give you your permit, and then we're going to come out and do it. just do the inspections. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, some homeowners associations have uh, cert- certain regulations within mm-hmm. their ordinance that says, uh, not an ordinance, but a homeowner's policy. Or I don't know what, know what you call that, but right. l- let's say they say no front-facing garage. Mm-hmm. Um, but then someone wants to come in and build a garage, and that garage is now going to be... yeah front facing it might be in the back of the property Mm -hmm. in a a ways so to what extent do you get involved in those kind of issues that are HOA so usually um, we'll work hand in hand with some HOAs um, but a lot a lot of times we kind of stay away with that you know you're gonna you're gonna submit your plans to us we're gonna review it to make sure it meets the city standards but then we also recommend if you if you have an HOA in place check with them first because you're you're right there may be a standard that it's it's not a city standard it's mm-hmm. a neighborhood standard so you may get a permit from us and thinking we're you're good but we don't know every neighborhood standard um so Which could result in maybe a lawsuit or something right for sure um and a lot of hoas um the way those things are set up they almost have as much power if not more than than, than we have so a lot of times hoas will start um even with code enforcement, HOAs will try, try to handle it. If they can't handle it, they will reach out to us. And then sometimes we tell HOAs, we, we don't have a city ordinance on that. That's that's your neighborhood ordinance, so you know we, we can't help you. Mm-hmm. But you're right, always check with HOA. Okay. Uh, we talked uh, already about natural disasters and how codes mm-hmm. really started, but we still have natural disasters today. And then you're involved in that process as well. In other words, let's say a home was damaged from a mm-hmm. tornado you have to go in and make sure they're safe after Correct. that. Correct. So luckily, uh, I think really the last disaster that Murfreesboro had were the Good Friday tornadoes. Mm-hmm. Um, since then, we've had some minor flooding issues, but we do work with HEMA and FEMA. So we will go out with those guys. Usually what happens is the uh, fire department, police, those are going to be your first responders, you know, right when the incident happens. Maybe a few hours later or that next morning, uh, the building codes team will go out and we will survey every structure to be, su- to be sure if it's habitable or not. But we're also going to take pictures and document it, and we're going to send that back to TEMA or FEMA, all that information. 
Hmm. So that is vital uh, that we're going to go out and inspect that, get that information back, because that also uh, goes back to how much money we can receive from FEMA um, to repair those damages. So uh, we, we play a vital part in that to help ensure that we get money to build back. What are some of the things then looking forward in the future that uh, Building and Codes has planned now that you've been director for about a year? you have any new yeah. items coming up? So we, we've got quite a few things. Uh, we're, we have some new software called CityWorks. Uh, we've been working on that. We currently use it uh, to do property maintenance. So the town of Smyrna and Rutherford County actually use it as well. So we're going to be switching permitting software hopefully in the next next year or so we're, we're, we're we have to build it out we have to put our systems inside that software so that takes time to get everything right and we're also going to use another software that does electronic plan review so right now we currently only accept paper copies so we're, hmm. we're a little behind the times in that fact but we're going to start doing electronic plan review which will allow architects to submit digitally and then it will, it's also going to allow our inspectors in the field to have software where they can review plans, you know, on an iPad or on a computer as they're walking through a job and not necessarily have to go back to a job trailer. So that's that's a few things that we got there. The city works and the on base, which is the review, it's going to make it a whole lot more transparent. Um, so if you submit from the outside right now, short of calling up here and saying, hey, where, where are my plans at? Where, where am I at? Where am I at in this review process? There's not a lot out there, but with this new software, you're going to be able to log in and see exactly where your plans are in the software. So I think that'll help as far as transparency. And then we're also creating a new uh, sign ordinance. Uh, our sign ordinance is a bit out of dated and been amended so many times. Uh, you know, we've been working on a new sign ordinance to kind of catch up with technology. And so we, we're on our third draft of that right now, and we're trying to finalize things on that. Um, so. You can probably look for a new sign ordinance, hopefully in the next year or so as well. When you referred to property maintenance as part of this new technology mm -hmm. that you'll be using, I think yeah. you called it CityWorks, how will that work uh, in, with, with regard to property maintenance itself? Yeah, so right now, like I said, we've been using property maintenance uh, for a year or two on it now. And what happens is it's, it's GIS-based, it's map-based. So the inspector will go out to your property they see a violation, they'll literally drop a, like a pin or a dot on that property. It kind of creates, uh, creates a case. We select what your violation is, which could be lawn parking, weeds and grass, and then it automatically generates a letter. Um, so it kind of does a lot of the work for us, creates the letters, and then it'll generate that letter, and then we'll print it off and, and mail you that letter. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for being our guest yeah. on The Insider. This is really interesting. There's so much here but if the public has any questions, they can just reach out to the department. Yeah, feel free to you know come by our office on the second floor or just call us, um, send us emails. I think, like I said, we have probably one of the one of the best staffs. Of course, I'm a little biased. Uh, I think they do a great job, and you know, come up here and see us. We're always going to stop and talk to you. Okay, Kevin, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Kevin Jones has been the insider guest. He's the director of the Building and Codes Department. For more information on the Murfreesboro Building and Codes Department, visit the city's website at murfreesborotn.gov, or you can also call 615-893-3750. Or you, for some issues involving planning, it's planning at murfreesborotn.gov. We've been highlighting inspections and other matters in the city Building and Codes Department with Director Kevin Jones. The Insider originates from City Hall. Thanks for listening via Podbeam, Spotify, Apple Podcast, Amazon Music Audible, and Google Podcast. You can also watch The Insider on YouTube and Facebook. For more information on the fast-growing city of Murfreesboro, it's murfreesborotn.gov. Insider is the official podcast for the city of Murfreesboro. I'm Mike Browning, and thanks a lot for joining us.